You're the mic master, aren't you? I guess I will. Mic master, yeah. <laughs> this will be like easing me in slowly to <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If we could come to order, please. Thank you. I want to welcome and give a warm welcome to the members of the committee that are here and the members of the public who will be on this journey with us as part of the process of getting fair redistricting plans for the state of Georgia. But as we do for most of our committee meetings, I want to begin with an opening prayer, and I would call on Senator Greg Dolezal, please, to open us up in a prayer. Amen. Thank you, Senator Dolezal. So, I will call to order the joint meeting of the Senate Reapportionment and Redistricting and the House Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment Committees. I welcome you and thank you for your attendance. So, a little bit about the process. The first step, uh, this is the first step in a long process. Uh, it's going to be more challenging this time because of the delays that we've had in the census data collection process, of course, related to COVID-19 last year. But first, let's discuss the process generally, and then we'll talk about the process for this particular meeting this afternoon, which we'll lead into this evening. We as chairs, myself, along with my co-chair, Chairman Bonnie Rich from the House, are committed to an open, fair redistricting process. That is why each of us have reached out to all members of our respective bodies to ask that they meet with us to discuss their area and their district. We want to hear from everyone, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, so that we can take all of that valuable information and have it to inform us on the approach that we will take in redrawing the maps. If you haven't responded to those emails yet, please do so quickly. We want to meet with you and hear from you and your thoughts about your district, and that is to the members of the committees. This is, and, and the bodies. This is gonna be a learning process for all of us and we're gonna to learn together as elected officials and we're gonna do this in the right and honorable way. But we also want to be sure that we're hearing from the public in addition to the elected officials. We're gonna do that through a couple of methods. Chairman Rich. First, this is the first hearing out of 11 public hearings that we are going to hold across the state to hear from the public to get their input about redistricting. We had a phenomenal amount of interest in this, which is really good. We like that. Um, we are able to take only the first 60 signups, however, because we want to give each person speaking time to get their points across to us. So even giving everyone two minutes, we'll still go into a couple of hours of testimony here. But we do have 10 more meetings coming up, some in person and some virtual, and everyone is welcome. We'll be holding hearings in Atlanta here in this room. We will also be in Cumming, Dalton, Athens, Augusta, Brunswick, Albany, Columbus, and Macon. We're gonna have a busy summer. <laughs> we'll be holding at least one more virtual hearing. At each of these hearings, we'll hear what people in different parts of the state want to tell us about their area and the process for drawing plans. Secondly, we'll be collecting written comments about parts of the state. We are going to have a dedicated website for that. There will be a link that members of the public can reach from our committee websites. Our goal is to ensure that every comment that we get goes into a central location so that we can utilize it and draw upon it in the map drawing process. Third, we're going to be making some changes to processes to ensure that we collect every piece of useful information about this process. Members of the General Assembly received some guidance from outside counsel this afternoon about preserving the importance, uh, about the importance of preserving records and information. We'll be making some adjustments to our email and our voicemail systems to ensure that everything is being captured and preserved. All of that is with the goal of ensuring that we get everyone's input on this process. So 
one of the things that's on everyone's mind is when will we have a special session for the purpose of working on and adopting the maps? And the answer is we don't know yet. The Census Bureau is saying that we'll be getting partial data in late August and that, that could be used to draw the maps, but with the full data not coming in until the end of September. Um, there's still some lawsuits pending about this data, but we can't do a lot about that until we actually get the data. Um, we'll be collecting comments right now about the process and the needs of the areas around our great state, and we will likely hear from more people once we have some certainty about the timing issue that I'm talking about. At some point after these hearings, we'll have committee meetings to adopt redistricting guidelines and principles. One final comment before Chairman Rich concludes uh, our opening comments, and that is with regard to the timing and, and those that are going to address this virtually. It's a short period of time. Two minutes doesn't seem like much, but we're trying to give as many people access to us as possible. So we would both ask that you please be respectful of the time that's allotted. And it's not respect for us, it's really respect for the people that have also signed up so they get their time with us as well. So here for our first meeting, this is how we're going to approach things. We are going to watch a short video that our media services folks put together to educate everyone on some of the basics of redistricting. Then we'll open it up to individuals who have signed up to speak. We'll um, remember that usually when politicians hold hearings, it's because they like to talk. But that is not our purpose tonight. Our purpose is to hear from you, Georgians, the members of our uh, public, our constituents. Consistent with how we've handled these hearings in 2001 and in the 2011 cycle, we're not going to ask questions or answer questions but we're going to listen to whatever it is that anyone wants to share with us. In order to respect everyone's time, we are limiting everyone to two minutes, but you can always submit written testimony through the portal that we discussed that will be on our committee websites. We will also have other meetings, as we mentioned, where you will have the opportunity to sign up and speak, one more virtual and some others in person. All of these hearings are going to be recorded, so we'll have the benefit of these moving forward. We can go back and watch them and refresh our memories, and also members of the public who can't attend live, who can't watch the virtual stream, will be able to access these and watch them as well. So with that, I think we can begin with our video. Are we ready to start that? Every 10 years following the decennial census, the process of redistricting begins all over our country. Let's take a look at what that redistricting is and what else we need to know before we begin this process in the state of Georgia. My name is Gina Wright and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment. We are a nonpartisan joint office of the Georgia General Assembly and we serve both the House and the Senate. What is redistricting? As the population in our state grows, the number of people in each district must be adjusted so that the population in each district is as close to equal as practicable. This is done by redistricting or modifying the boundary lines of the districts. In Georgia, our new 2020 census resident population total is 10,711,908 people. Because of this population increase, each of our 14 congressional districts will need to adjust to have 765,136 people in them. At the state level, our legislative branch of government has 56 state senators and 180 representatives in the state house elected by districts. State Senate districts will be redrawn to now include around 191,284 people. State House districts will also need to increase in population size to around 59,511 people. In the Georgia General Assembly, there is a standing committee on redistricting in both the House and the Senate. 
Each committee has a chairman. Hi, I'm Bonnie Rich. I'm chairman of the Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment Committee in the State House. I've served in that capacity since 2019. Since 2018, I have represented District 97, which includes parts of Duluth, Swanee, and Sugar Hill in Gwinnett County. Hello, I'm State Senator John F. Kennedy, and I represent the 18th District in the State Senate, which includes all of Monroe, Peach, Crawford, and Upson counties, and part of Bibb County and Houston County. I also am chairman of the Senate Redistricting and Reapportionment Committee. What is reapportionment, and how is it different from redistricting? The term apportionment is the act of dividing and allocating representation proportionally. The United States Constitution requires that all 435 House districts shall be apportioned among the 50 states based on population from each decennial census. There is a guarantee of at least one seat per state in the United States House, and a method of equal proportions determines how the other 385 are distributed. Every 10 years, states may gain or lose congressional districts based on how they gained or lost population in comparison to other states based on data from the decennial census. The state of Georgia presently has 14 seats in the U.S. House, and the 2010 census resulted in a gain of one new seat for the state following an increase of two new districts in 2000. It's common to interchange the term reapportionment with the term redistricting, but the two terms really don't mean the same thing. Reapportionment only occurs at the federal level when U.S. House districts are distributed amongst the states. Even with a gain of over a million people in Georgia over the past decade, Georgia will continue to have 14 congressional districts. When does redistricting take place? Traditionally, the governor of Georgia issues a call for a special legislative session in late summer or early fall following the arrival of the new census data. The sole purpose of this session is to adopt newly redrawn maps for all statewide district plans and may also include new maps for local county commission or school board districts. The session occurs so that all county election officials have sufficient time to update voter district assignments once the process is complete prior to elections the next year. After the Georgia General Assembly adopts new maps and the governor signs the bills into law, they become the new election districts for use in the next election cycle or on the date specified in the legislation. This year, with COVID-related delays in the census, the special session will likely take place later in the year because we will not receive full census data until late August or September. What other factors do we have to consider besides equal population? The first mission of redistricting is to ensure that districts are roughly equal to each other. Equalizing population ensures that each individual's vote counts the same toward their representatives. But equal population is only one part of the puzzle. Maps must also comply with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and traditional principles of redistricting, like ensuring communities of interest are represented, avoiding major changes to existing representation in the legislature, and keeping local government jurisdictions whole. Those legal criteria are what often keeps maps from being drawn as perfect squares across our state. Why do we have public hearings? The redistricting process begins with hearing from the public. The General Assembly is ready to hear from you about the uniqueness of your part of the state, what communities of interest are here, and what important factors it should consider as we all prepare to redraw the districts later this year. Is that it? All right. Very good. Thank you. I hope you found that informative. I want to thank uh, the press offices of both the House and the Senate uh, and everyone who worked hard, uh, and Gina, of course, on putting that video together. All right. We're to the point now we'd like to receive comments. So as uh, co-chair of this committee, I'd like to recognize Ken Lawler as our first witness. So I'll ask those that are in control of the... Pardon? Okay. Mr. Lawler, if you could unmute yourself, please. And be happy to recognize you, and we'll hear from you now. 
Thank you so much, uh, Chairs Kennedy, Rich, and members of the committees. I am Ken Lawler, Chair of Fair Districts Georgia, and I am pleased to have the opportunity to testify with you today. We are a nonpartisan organization. Our sole mission is the production of fair maps for the Georgia General Assembly and Congressional Delegation using a process that is transparent and adheres to common redistricting principles. We do not favor the election of any candidate or party. I'm here today to speak about three things, public and community participation, transparent process, and fair maps. Many of the other speakers you'll hear from today are providing input on public and community participation and transparency, and we support all those principles. I'm gonna focus my short remarks on the desired outcome of fair maps. We define fair maps as not favoring one political party over another, yet reflecting the natural political preferences of Georgia's population. In addition, fair maps must provide adequate minority representation complying with the Voting Rights Act. The most important thing we think we can do this year in Georgia to create fair maps is to adopt a new process to have nonpartisan independent benchmarks or fairness tests for the maps. These benchmarks will provide in advance the number of expected Republican, Democratic, and competitive districts based on the natural political geography of the state, and they will provide the expected number of minority districts. Now, Fair Districts Georgia is partnering with the Princeton Gerrymandering Project to provide these benchmarks. I am pleased to tell you today that we have completed phase one of the work, a study of the past 20 years of redistricting in Georgia. Tomorrow, June 16th at 4 p.m., we have invited all of you to a legislators only briefing at which we will present these findings. And if you need the invitation for that, that was sent out a couple of weeks ago, I'm happy to provide it uh, through the staff here today. We will be at this briefing, we will be explaining the advanced analytics behind these benchmarks and the plans for creating them in time for map drawing later this year, based on the August and September census data. Now these analytics have never been used in Georgia before. In fact, they didn't even exist in 2011. It's very new technology. Fair Districts Georgia and Princeton are proud to bring this innovation and expertise to your committees. We are offering it as a public service. We think that adopting these benchmarks will go a long way towards building trust and confidence thank you, in the Thank process. you, Mr. Lowell. If you could take about 10 or 15 seconds and wrap it up. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. And we believe that MAPS meeting benchmarks may help Georgia avoid costly litigation. I'm including more details in my written statement, and I'm available to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lawler. We appreciate your participation. All right, at this time, we would like to recognize the second witness signed up. Uh, this witness has not entered, has not uh, signed onto Zoom yet, but just to be sure she uh, is out there, if she's listening, Debbie Winkowski. If you are interested, if you will come lo uh, log into Zoom, we will take you at the end of the meeting. The next witness who has signed up is Suzanne Minersine, M-I-N-A-R-C-I-N-E. And we are ready for your testimony. All right, uh, Ms. Minersine, if you will unmute yourself on the Zoom app. Okay, we will move on to the fourth person who has signed up, Christian Dent, D-E-N-T. If you will unmute yourself. Yep. You uh, may proceed. We'll have the timer so you can watch your time. Okay. Hi, my name is Christian Dent. Uh, I'm a rising high school senior in Henry County. Uh, and the fact that a young person like myself is there speaking on redistricting should demonstrate to this committee the, uh, the broad consensus of Georgians of all ages, um, ethnicities and backgrounds for structural change and reform to this often corrupt and gerrymandered process of redistricting. With all due respect to this committee, I find it redundant that the citizens of Georgia have to voice themselves through a computer screen to politicians who are in turn going to choose their own voters by drawing their own districts instead of letting the voters choose their representatives as it's supposed to be. I've seen gerrymandering up uh, by the majority party in the state legislature up close and personal by living in State House District 111 here in Henry County, which was planned to be redrawn and especially gerrymandered in 2015 to exclude majority African American areas to help out Republican incumbents. It was such a blatantly obvious example of gerrymandering that Republicans backed off in 2017 to avoid a pending federal lawsuit. 
This is just one of many examples of majority party gerrymandering here in the state of Georgia. And we know it won't be the last because we know that the party operatives and corrupt politicians actively plotting and attempting to do it again this year as we speak. We can even see this by the inequality and partisan nature of this committee with a two to one Republican majority on both the Senate and House committees on redistricting. So I implore with the utmost severity to Chairwoman Rich, Chairman Kennedy, and all members of this committee to give the power back to the voters and people in Georgia to pick their representatives instead of politicians handpicking their voters by gerrymandering districts. I encourage you to all to do the right thing and support legislatively an independent redistricting commission that will fairly and in a nonpartisan way redraw districts in the state of Georgia. Thank you very much. Pick it up. Thank you, Mr. Dent. We appreciate you being with us this evening. Who's next? Okay. Okay. Looks like um, Bandish Panday is next. And forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. And um, are the checks the ones in the. In the okay. All right. Okay. Are you there? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, com committee members. My name is Badanj Pandey, and I'm a student at Northview High School located in Johns Creek, Georgia. At my school, I represent various student organizations involved with civic en engagement, as well as community service. My community is currently in S State Senate District 48 and State House District 50. And we have one of the highest Asian American populations in the state. Interestingly, Asian Americans like myself account for nearly a third of our community's growth in the past 10 years. And yet in those 10 years, we haven't had a single Asian American representative until the 2020 election. Our community is predominantly people of color and immigrants like me who share similar stories. So when Asian American hate crimes skyrocketed by 145% in the past year, it was not only harrowing for those in my community, but also a stark reminder of the lack of representation that we have. This has left our community largely apathetic and disillusioned to politics, so much so that less than half of eligible voters in our community cast their ballots in elections before 2020. And this trend, it's not just limited to my city, my community, or my district. It's a trend that has permeated throughout the state. There are a quarter of a million AAPI voters in Georgia yet they only make up 2% of the representation in the General Assembly. That's why I ask that when drawing the districts of our state that will remain in place for the next decade, the diversity of our community is represented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pandy. All right, who do we have next? All right, Karuna Ramasharadan. I know I didn't say that right, so if you're there in the, in the, uh, in the waiting area, uh, we'd like to give you the floor. And let me, yes, while, we're pulling, while we're pulling you up, let me tell you, for the, for the other folks um, that have signed up, what we're doing is we're going in the order of the list for people that are in the waiting room virtually. So if we've skipped over you, we'll certainly try to get back to you. Uh, but we're trying to manage this without as uh, much downtime as possible. So, okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Karuna Ramachandran, and I'm the campaign manager for the Georgia Redistricting Alliance, also known as GRA. Uh, GRA is a coalition of 15 nonpartisan organizations that are dedicated to ensuring that the voices of communities of color are brought to the forefront of redistricting here in Georgia. Now today, the Georgia Redistricting Alliance, along with 47 partners from across the state submitted a letter to you all. This letter details the baseline requirements needed in order to meaningfully include our communities in redistricting processes, such as the ability to give input on draft maps. These organizations represent African-American, Latino, Asian-American, AMEMSA, African diaspora, and queer and trans communities of Georgia. These organizations represent the growing majority population of our state who are still underrepresented and underserved by elected officials across the state. Our communities are actively engaged in redistricting education, community mapping, and community storytelling. 
And this is valuable data that should be used to inform redistricting plans. Now, earlier, the video you show, showed referenced incorporating communities of interest into mapping plans. However, our community is very concerned about this actually being the case. We have members across the state who would like to participate in public input sessions and share their stories and data, but they have no details about these meetings. In addition to the letter sent to date, several organizations also sent a letter dated April 19th, to which we have not received a formal or informal response. Today's meeting was announced with very little time to notify community members and give them time to prepare. Additionally, many of our community members were not selected to speak today, and they have not been given you know, a formal process for submitting their testimony in writing in advance of the meeting. Um, uh, you know, public meetings are about redistricting our valuable tool uh, to hear from constituents across the state and incorporate findings into redistricting plans. However, with the lack of transparency thus far in the process, these meetings seem to be an effort to check a box rather than creating real pathways for meaningful public involvement. Okay, um, thank, you, thank you very much. Just take about 10 or 15 seconds and wrap up, please. Thank of you. Of course, thank you. The organizations that GRA partners with have invested a lot of resources and we're, we've offered workable solutions. We're willing to partner with you to ensure redistricting is transparent, inclusive, and equitable. And uh, we, we call on you to invest in us as well. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, and thanks for joining us. All right, next is Levita Tuff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to the chairs of this committee and its members. My name is Levita Tuff, and I'm the policy director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta. Our job is to defend, resist, and advance the rights of the AAPI community here in Georgia, along with other immigrant communities. Today, I wanna to discuss how language equity is so critical to this process. 2020 proved that Georgians want to be civically engaged, and that includes a desire to be an active participant in the reapportionment process. Yet, with English only approaches and methods, the Georgia legislature will for sure leave out those who want to be engaged, educated, and informed. As is, proposed town halls are by no means accessible or inclusive especially to those who are considered limited English proficient. The immigrant population in Georgia has grown to be over a million since 2018. That means that one in 10 Georgia residents is an immigrant and 45.9% of immigrants are limited English proficient. Immigrants in Georgia are one of the fastest growing electorates, leading with AAPI voters who experienced a 47% increase and eligible voters from 2012 to 2013, totaling nearly a quarter of a million. And despite this, 89% of LEP voters do not receive language assistance that they are entitled to. It is important that we recognize that Georgia is home to over 100 different languages. Elected officials represent all residents of Georgia, not just those who are native to the English language, when key information is restricted to English only, LEP residents are deterred from engaging and participating in the redistricting process. It is this committee's responsibility to make it abundantly clear to the public that they will not be left out of this process. That means informing, educating, and creating equitable access in all the languages of the communities of interest that they speak and read. Language access should not be seen as a privilege and is essential to ensuring that LEP communities are fairly represented in their districts. To ensure an accessible process, hearings must be publicly accessible, either in person or via video access, including delegation meetings that will consider and approve county commission and county school board maps. Joint redistricting committees must commit to include all Georgians. This means providing resources, including announcements, fact sheets, and any public facing materials into a minimum set of languages required to reach diverse Georgians, which means at least Spanish. Ms. Tuff, Korean. let me ask you to please take a few seconds and wrap up, okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Hindi, and Arabic. It is so crucial that all Georgians be allowed to participate in this process, and language should not be a barrier. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you participating. May I, may I ask just for logistical purposes, were you able to hear the timer alarm? 
go off, Ms. Tuff? Okay. No, we need I to see if we can. Okay. We'll, we'll reposition that. I apologize. <laughs> we'll reposition that so the speakers can uh, can hear the alarm uh, for that. Okay. All right, Chairman. Rich. All right. Um, at this time, we will invite. Put this signed in. Michelle Zulaga. To please. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to, we're setting a timer, but I realize now that you all can't see the timer. So um, you want to put it, yeah, we're going to put it in front of a microphone and you'll hear the alarm. So when you hear the alarm, if you'll just kind of take five or 10 seconds to wrap up, but you can go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you to the redistricting committee. My name is Michelle Suluaga. I'm the Civic Participation Manager for the Latino Community Fund Georgia. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we also lead the Latinos for Democracy Coalition. Um, we are also part of the, the redistricting alliance. Latinos for Democracy is currently leading an effort to educate the Latino community about the redistricting process in Georgia. This has not come without its challenges. Although dates and times have been announced to the public about the redistricting hearings throughout the state, the locations have not yet been announced. This is critical information so that community members will show up and have their say on how these impactful lines will be drawn throughout their communities and ultimately decide the fate for their, the communities uh, will live. Let me be clear. We need to know the locations of where the hearings will be held well in advance so that community members will be present. We also ask that when you draw, draw these impactful lines, racial equity be in the forefront of everyone's mind. It is important for all electoral districts to reflect communities that live in them and for, for life-changing resources such as parks and recreation, education, an accurate representation at the municipal, state, and federal level to be set in place for all. As communities change and become more diverse, it is critical that district maps reflect that. When we have accurate representations, our communities get access to resources that many take for granted, such as language accessibility, access to the polls, public transportation, and places for our community members to gather and connect as one. This is why we stand with many when we say that we want maps that will unite our state and not divide our communities. And this is why we need unity maps. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you so much for your testimony. I think that timer there is working out well. <laughs> Okay. I'm so sorry to interrupt. To be clear, I did not uh, hear the timer, but I did time myself many times today. You did it very well then. You were right on the dot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, and we're going on to the next witness who is waiting in the Zoom room. This will be Alex Ames. If you will unmute your microphone and you can proceed. Hello. Thank you. My name is Alex Ames and I am a community organizer and a student at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I'm actually taking time out of class to be here today. Uh, now, Georgia Tech is currently nested within State House District 56, but is divided between SD 36 and 39. Georgia Tech is a powerhouse. Our school has been around since 1885. We're the third largest college in the state, and our graduates are the future of Georgia's economy. But because our representation is divided, we vote in different locations. We cannot effectively lobby our legislators to meet the needs of our community. We share a transit system, a housing system, community spaces and classes, yet we're denied our ability to advocate collectively for our interests as a campus. For example, projects that include funding for the university system and green space access for uniquely young and innovation-minded community here at Tech often require us to get support from legislators. Being divided into different districts weakens that voice. This isn't something new. All across the state, Georgia's campuses of nearly half a million students are gerrymandered and sliced in ways that stifle the voices and interests of the next generation of Georgians. From Kennesaw to Athens, our schools are divided so that even though our state had the largest youth turnout in America last year, our votes are worth less. We all want American citizens to be active participants in democracy, but what does it teach our students when we draw their maps so that even when they do vote, their voter efficacy is stifled? We're teaching young people to distrust and disengage in our democracy by gerrymandering them. If we want American democracy to be vital for decades to come, 
we must ensure Georgia's campuses have the representation that lies at the core of our nation's democracy. One person, one vote, and equal representation for all of us. I implore you to draw fair maps for my campus, Georgia Tech, and for all students across Georgia's university system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ames, for your testimony. Okay, and the next on the list is Virginia Clark. Ms. Clark, if you will unmute your microphone, the floor is yours. Ms. Clark, our system shows that you are you're online and the floor is yours. Okay, then we will move on to, I will pass. Oh, are thank you there? You. Oh, I will pass, thank you. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. All right, we will move on to Sunny Park. Are you there, Sunny Park? The floor is yours, and then after that, is going to be yes. Niles Francis, and then next up will be Deborah Olorenzola. Right. Hello, committee members, and thank you for inviting me today. My name is Sunny Park, and I am a high school student currently passionate about Georgia politics. As a rising high school senior, I can't wait to vote in our elections once I turn 18 in a few months, and so are a few of my classmates as well. But with the districts we live in divided so awkwardly, first-time voters like us have a hard time knowing which communities our, represent, our representatives represent. So when young adults like us end up voting, our voices end up becoming silenced due to its complicated shapes like District 117 and many more covering only the edges of multiple counties. I implore you when drawing to ensure that our future Georgian voters, Georgian voters will have much simpler, better representing better representing districts, so that not only will local, local voter, voter turnout rise, but also in result, create better representation for our communities and our future. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Park, thank you very much. Next in the Zoom room, Niles Francis. Are you there? Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you all so much for um, doing these hearings and for encouraging Georgia voters like myself to get involved in this once in a decade process. It's often um, very partisan, but it is my hope that you all will listen to input from um, all Georgia voters as we um, undertake this um, historic and consequential process. In the opening video there, um, Senator Kennedy mentioned um, that the districts must comply with the um, Voting Rights Act, but a certain provision of the Voting Rights Act has been struck down since the last time maps were redrawn. Um, in 2013, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Shelby County versus Holder case. Um, that gutted Section 5 of the, um, of the Voting Rights Act, which basically said that um, states like Georgia, which have a history of racial discrimination and voting laws, needed to pre-clear any changes to election laws and redistricting maps with the federal government. Um, but I say that to say that even though these maps do not have to be pre-cleared by the federal government, it is my expectation and my hope that these maps are pre-cleared with Georgia voters and not politicians, special interests, who, who will almost certainly play a big role in the process. So um, I hope to be a, um, to be to continue observing the process in the weeks and months ahead. It's going to be a very, very grueling process, no doubt. And um, even though this is usually a very partisan process, it is my hope that this will be a process that um, that um, unites Georgians rather than divide them um, in partisan and racial fashion. So I look forward to observing um, future hearings and watching future hearings. And um, I hope that you all will continue to be as transparent as possible and try to limit the impact that um, politicians and special interests will have in the process. Mr. Francis, thank you very much. Thanks for the comments. And by the way, so far you win the best background award. 
uh, for anyone who's <laughs> appeared before us. So thank you for being with us. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You all, all have right. a good night. Thank you. You too. Okay. Uh, next, hopefully in the Zoom room, is Deborah Alan Ron Solu. Hello. Hello. Deborah, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Debbie, and I'm a recently graduated high school student, and I've lived in Gwinnett County for the past 13 years. I've come to learn more about my county through service projects, my peers' diverse backgrounds, and from personal experience moving from a Title I school district to one that is more financially endowed. One of my main takeaways after all these years is that families throughout Georgia, especially low-income families, need to be able to advocate for better school funding, but this is difficult when their voices are diluted through gerrymandering. Throughout my schooling, I have learned how proper representation affects young minds simply by seeing my peers interact with teachers who they feel reflect them. Whether the teachers have similar interests or experiences to, to their pupils, if a student can find the connection, that student will be more likely to see, succeed in all areas. This relationship between students and staff is mutual. When teachers have a genuine relationship and connection with their students, there's a feel feeling of community obligation, there's hope for change, and there's a drive to ensure that that change comes. So just as it's important for one to feel recognized within the classroom, community members must also be given the opportunity to be heard through their representatives so that they may exercise their drive to better their communities. Not everyone is able to eventually move out of district for a better education like I was able to, and families shouldn't have to do so in order to ensure a good education for their children. Thus, in light of the movement of families across school district lines over the past years, I implore you, the committee, to not dilute the voices of the less endowed. Please provide families of similar socioeconomic statuses with full power to advocate for children's education by, for their children's education by mining school district boundaries when remapping state Senate and House districts. That way, there calls for equitable funding stability, low teacher turnover, and staff members who care about their children may be heard. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. All right. Mr. Ray Thomas. Mr. Thomas, are you in the Zoom room and ready? I, no, I'm not ready, so I'll take a pass. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We can certainly come back to you if you'd like. All right. Laurie McLean, are you available? Ms. McLean, Laurie McLean? Okay. Next. Camille Brown. Camille Brown, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi. Hello. Um, this is my first time with this. I appreciate the invite and I'm looking forward to the opportunity and seeing how this um, transpires. It's going to be my first um, um, attempt at learning the process. I am calling from Cherokee County um, and I am definitely going to be looking at what happens in Cherokee County um, because I know that it's probably grown and I'm not sure if um, I'm interested in having it split. So I would like to get the information, take it back to the people that this will affect, and I hope to just continue to work and learn um, and to be a part of the process. And I thank you for this time, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you guys more in person and also um, uh, to be on these calls as much as possible. So I hope that um, when you are when the legislature is looking at these maps that they do it um equitably um equally um and to to focus on the the well-being of the state overall and that it will make our state stronger in the future so um thank you and i look forward to working with you thanks thank you miss brown thanks for being with us all right um kayla kane Kayla Kane. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Chairman Kennedy, Chairman Rich, and members of the committee. My name is Kayla Kane, and I'm a data and research analyst with the Southern Poverty Law Center's Voting Rights Practice Group. The SPLC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to upholding the fundamental right of all citizens to vote. 
SPLC strongly encourages the Joint Redistricting Committee to engage in a meaningful, open, public, and transparent dialogue with residents and community groups as you collect important information about residences, their communities of interest, and how they've been helped and harmed by redistricting in the past and future. Fair redistricting plans are essential if all Georgia voters are to have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. Unfortunately, Georgia's past redistricting plans have been marred by their harmful effects on people of color, particularly African-American communities. Georgia has repeatedly violated the Voting Rights Act by fragmenting concentrated African-American communities to multiple districts, therefore diluting their voting strength. In just one example among many, a three-judge federal court found that the fifth congressional district created by the 1981 redistricting process was, quote, drawn to suppress voting black strength in Georgia. And that, quote, was no legitimate non-discriminatory reason why the fifth district was drawn the way it was. This history, which is discussed more fully in the accompanying written testimony that we submitted earlier today, illustrates why it is imperative that communities of color provide meaningful input to avoid any dilution of their voting strength. Unfortunately, the public town halls that are currently scheduled do not sufficiently engage communities because the public does not have enough information, including census data that won't be released to the states until later this fall, as well as draft maps or information about the special legisl legislative session and other legislative meetings. To provide to this community with a full range of information it needs to make the proper determinations in drawing district lines. Therefore, SPLC strongly encourages the Joint Redistricting Committee to provide ample opportunities for public testimony. Our written testimony provides specific suggestions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. We now have Jerry Hutchinson. You are the next on the list. And we show that you are currently in the Zoom room. Hello, can you hear me? All right, you may go ahead, thank you. I'm a retiree and an ordinary citizen who pays attention to our civic affairs. I strongly urge you to change the way voting districts are drawn in Georgia. We need districts with a healthy mixture of Republicans, Democrats, and independents within their boundaries. We are too partisan, too polarized, and too divided in our politics. Drawing new districts that aren't tilted toward keeping the majority party in power will be a start. Let Georgia be a leader in this approach. I don't like it that politicians get to pick their voters through gerrymandering the districts instead of voters picking their political leaders. I want to see more moderate political leaders elected who will be responsive to their constituents and willing and eager to reach across the aisle to find compromises that move Georgia forward. Having to run in districts with a health, healthy mix of Republicans, Democrats, and independents will encourage this. I offer these suggestions. That a bipartisan citizens commission, which reflects the diversity of our state's population, be formed to draw the lines. To be explicit, that the people who draw the lines are not the same folks who will run for office. That all meetings, hearings, and decisions be made in public so the citizens may observe and be informed that input and even suggested district lines be solicited and received from the public and seriously considered. That decision makers hold all meetings and hearings in public as their work and decisions are being made. I realize it will take a magnanimous and gracious spirit for the majority party to relinquish their power to draw voting districts, but you can do this. I urge you to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. OK, we have next uh, Benjamin Geiger. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. I'm Benjamin Geiger, a recently graduated senior from West Lawrence High School in Dublin, Georgia. I'm from central Georgia, an area of Georgia that I think is um, not necessarily represented very well on the current legislature map. Um, I believe that potentially drawing a district that would include the cities of Macon, Warner Robins, Perry, 
Dublin, Milledgeville, Sandersville, and any other cities in the Central Georgia area would be beneficial to the citizens of Central Georgia. In addition, I'd also like to see that all maps have an equal proportion of Republicans and Democrats to potentially um, have about this to create more equitable um, representation for all Georgians, regardless of political affiliation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, we have Mashara Davis. Mashara Davis. Hi, yes, thank you to the chairs and to the committee. Good evening. My name is Mishara Davis, and I'm the Vice President of Political and Civic Engagement for Women Engaged and a proud Georgia resident. Women Engaged sits at the intersection of reproductive justice and integrated voter engagement. We conduct year-round nonpartisan voter engagement and education to build power in BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities across Metro Atlanta. And we also provide leadership development to millennial and Gen Z Black voters. I'm here today to talk to you about why a fair, transparent redistricting process is so important to our organization and the voters we serve. We believe that voters should choose their politicians, not the other way around. Fair redistricting ensures that political leaders can be held accountable by their communities. Historically, we know race is always a major factor in unfair gerrymandering. The intentional manipulation of the redistricting process to reduce the political power of certain racial groups in Georgia and across the nation is well documented. 2021 will be the first year of redistricting without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. This makes it even more important that the process is done publicly and transparently. Our organization was founded in the shadow of Shelby V. Holder, and we are here today to ensure that Georgia legislators understand that even in the absence of preclearance or a nonpartisan redistricting commission, we are watching, and we expect a fair, collaborative redistricting process done in full view of the public. Redistricting has a very real impact on the voices of citizens in every county, city, and town in our great state of Georgia and across this nation. Legislators must listen carefully to communities, especially those of color, who are most likely to be harmed by unfair districts. I appreciate speaking this evening and believe that more opportunities like this for our voices to be heard must be provided in advance throughout the redistricting process. Thank you, and this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thanks for being with us. All right, Thank next you. in the Zoom room, uh, Christine Lowry. Ms. Lowry? I pass. Ms. Lowry, are you there? Oh, okay, very good, thank you. Uh, next, Andrew Lewis. Mr. Lewis. Good afternoon. Good thank afternoon, you for thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you for allowing me to speak. The abuse of redistricting in Georgia is not exclusive to either Republicans or Democrats. The important duty is hijacked by the party in power every 10 years. Lack of transparency, allowing for the abuse of the citizens of our state takes place behind closed doors each decade. Such abuses undermine a healthy and vibrant democracy. I offer two solutions for today and one for the future. Require all that all proposed maps be available online within 48 hours of being submitted. Stream all hearings live and post them online so that the public can easily assess and view the discussions. For the future, the Georgia General Assembly must pass a nonpartisan commission to oversee the once a decade redistricting process. 17 states have such commissions with eight of those states being Republican led states. The 17 states are Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Idaho, Iowa, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Utah, Vermont, and Washington. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you for being with us and thank you for your comments. Teddy Reese. Mr. Reese, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Chairman Kennedy, and thank you, Chairwoman Rich, for having us today. Um, I'm Teddy Reese. I'm an attorney here in Columbus, Georgia. And also, I must acknowledge one of my representatives here, Representative Richard Smith. Thank you for your attention to this process, sir, and um, for being here representing our area. I just have four quick points. Um, I didn't make a, a speech or anything. Um, some of the things I just feel are, that are important. One, uh, the regional meetings, if we can make sure that those are well advertised so that all citizens will have an opportunity to participate. I understand we use mediums now, social, such as social media and put things on websites and things of that nature. But all of us that signed on today, at some point you guys captured our email addresses. If you can start building an internal database and make sure you share that information with the organizations and the people that are here, you will be going a long way in making sure that the information is shared. Um, two, quick and immediate release of the data. Um, kind of echoing what the previous speaker just said. I think it's gonna be important in the transparency aspect that this data be shared immediately so that people can start planning and looking at where the population shifts are within our state and also within our local areas. Um, three, well-established and a robust publication of the maps when they are complete. Share them with the local media outlets. Again, go into a database of emails that you should have collected with all of our Zoom signups and things of that nature. The more Georgians we get this information out to, the better and better positioned we are to make sure that transparency is at the very top. And my fourth point is the preservation of underrepresented communities. And that's basically so that all voices can be heard. We want to make sure that all voices are heard all over Georgia, even in some of the rural areas right here along the west part of the state, which I think is the most beautiful part of Georgia, right here along the Chattahoochee Valley. We just want to make sure that everyone is represented appropriately and that we're still one Georgia. So I know we're early in the process. I'm looking forward to attending additional meetings. And thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to speak today. You're welcome. Mr. You're welcome, Mr. Reese. Thank you for being with us. All right, um, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping here. It's our understanding that we have accommodated everyone who is in the Zoom room. If, there's, if you are there uh, or you expected to speak and, or you were signed up and we missed you or skipped you somehow, uh, I would ask you to speak up or let us know um, if you're there. Uh, and we certainly want to recognize you. And while we're in the process of doing that, let me also mention on behalf of Chairman Rich and I, so the part of the idea really behind the Zoom meeting or the, the virtual meeting was to give access to folks around the state uh, who we may not be coming to your backyard necessarily, or it may be that getting out is not as easy for you as it is for some. And so we wanted to begin our meetings uh, this way, virtually. Uh, and so we also wanted to make sure that everyone who had a chance to sign up uh, had a chance to speak to us. So that's why we allocated only two minutes so we find ourselves with some extra time. Uh, and as uh, you have seen, we've had uh, for whatever the number of people that have spoken, that minus 60 is how many folks did not speak. Uh, so, uh, and that's everyone's prerogative. That's not a complaint at all, but uh, Chair, Chairman Rich and I want you to understand how we have tried to manage the time here. So do we, let me ask our staff, is there anyone else in the Zoom room? Okay, we don't. So with that, what Chairman Rich and I would like to do is open the floor for anyone who may have come today uh, from the public that would like to address the committee. And just by, and just by way of uh, uh, sort of where we're going, if there's no one in the room from the public that would like to address it, I'm going to open it up to legislators and committee members first. So I don't see anyone from the public. So with that, Yes, sir. Chair, I recognize you, sir. Thank you. What number do you have, sir? Okay. They're they're pressed. We we have them pressed here, so. I'd, Okay. Oh, you can go to the podium. You can go to the podium. Go to the podium. 
Yes, sir. They're, she, they're, they're all lit. It, all the microphones around him were completely, she had them illuminated, but uh, for some reason they're not turning them on. Oh, there we go. Hey. Okay. All right, there we go. Nope. Right here. Oh, over there. Oh. <laughs> we're going to work out. I'm, I'm sorry, your time's expired. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the bell. <laughs> no, sir, you have a floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question. Um, for the people in my area to sign up, was it advertised in the newspapers, or how did they know to sign up to speak? There was a press release um, that went out from media services for the House and the Senate. So it was up to the individual newspapers as to whether they published it, I suppose, is the way that works. Okay. So what I need to do to get my newspapers to publish it? Uh, I, I think so. I think that's part of it. But I know that the, the House press and the Senate press office worked to get the message out uh, as much as possible. It's our hope that this being the first one, that hopefully there'll be some interest and the momentum will build behind uh, getting the word out that this is the first of 11. And, uh, but but any, we're certainly open to any suggestions that you would like to make on how we can get the word out. Well, uh, um, social media would be good for me to get it out around my district because I certainly want my people to know about these hearings. Further question? Further question? Yes, sir. Um, after we get the data from the census, the numbers from the census, will we have further public hearings after we know what the numbers are? You know we don't we don't know yet um, because we haven't gotten the data yet and there's not necessarily a firm deadline our main our main goal is to meet the deadline of having the special session so that we can get the maps drawn and we just don't know what kind of time frame we're going to be bumping up against okay I mean, yeah thank you thank yes. you yes sir thank you and I think uh, my assistant told me, just told me that uh, all the information about the meetings are on Twitter. Is that right? It's just the same as it is during session. Like, I know that our press office puts things up on Twitter, and it's also the website. So, same communication happens. Um, I just don't think people are checking it. Yeah, that's just so we can, for the people who are watching virtually, I don't think your mic was on, but yes, the Senate and the House press offices published it both on Twitter and on Facebook, um, and then sent it out to the the newspapers but yeah we are I mean we are open to input on how to get this out to people because I would have liked to have heard from people for for two hours instead so um, I think maybe we need to have backups next time that might be a good good solution I didn't realize so many people would not show up and would pass <laughs> and I think also representative Jackson I know that chairman rich and I had contacted and reached out to the members um, in the districts where we are actually going to be physically coming and to help ask those people to get the word out in their district as well. Yes, sir. But thank you for the comments and the suggestions. All right. Yes, ma'am. Representative Butler. Excuse me. Senator Butler. Forgive me. Where was I? Leader Butler. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Forgive me for that. off. Oh, it's off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I have a, a statement that I'd like to make. 
Uh, as Minority Leader of the Georgia State Senate, I recognize that fair maps are crucial to ensure that every Georgian's vote counts equally. But fair maps require, number one, a transparent redistricting, redistricting process that truly values public input and empowers historically disenfranchised communities. Our state has experienced a significant demographic shift. Over the past 10 years, the black population in Georgia has grown by 14%. The Asian population has grown by 40%. And the Hispanic population has grown by 26%, while the white population has grown by only 2%. The map that we adopt during the 2021 special legislative session must reflect the changing face of Georgia and the need for historically disenfranchised voters to have a voice. And as Georgia evolves, ensuring that Georgians of color are reflected among their elected representative requires that we conduct the redistricting process transparently. Too often, legislators are not held accountable for leaving citizens in the dark, unaware of the process for drawing their districts. Georgians are entitled to not only examine the criteria used to create their own districts, but also provides substantive feedback on any proposed maps before they are adopted. Democracy cannot happen behind closed doors. Finally, the creation of fair maps requires meaningful opportunity to consider public input as we have today and hopefully we will do more in the future. The current process does not yet meet this critical standard. These town halls are being held months before the Census Bureau provides the final redistricting data to the states. They are happening outside of places like Gwinnett County, one of the fastest changing counties in the state. And they are happening with little advance notice. These town halls cannot be the only opportunity for the public to participate in their redistricting process. We cannot draw fair maps for Georgians without Georgians themselves being involved in a meaningful way. Our redistricting process must be open, democratic, and response representative of the interests of all Georgians. I urge the members of the Georgia General Assembly to ensure that we live up to these basic principles during this redistricting cycle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Leader Butler. Thank you for being here. Is there anyone else? Yes, ma'am, I'll let you recognize her. Those members. All right, Representative Alexander, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess my question was centered around really myself as a committee member. Um, were we going to adopt rules on how we were going to do the, the meetings going forward? That was one of the questions. And then uh, the other question was is that I know we have selected 11 locations to go around the state for a committee member. Will some of those be open up for virtuality? Or all those mostly in person so to get more people and more public input yeah thank you that um, yeah I did I circulated the the schedule with all of the information that I have which is the dates and the city locations um, the very last meeting is scheduled to be a virtual so that more people can can participate virtually when I first saw the signups for this I thought we might need to add a virtual meeting but Looks like we might be able to take care of it with one more virtual and our tour around the state, but I guess we can see. Okay. The then the one further question, Madam Chair, also too is, um, I understand that there was a link that went out for members to sign up and schedule meetings, but although that data is not available now, is that 
you know, to have a meeting or is it going to be additional meetings set up once you receive the data? Yeah, <laughs> this is, you're feeling, you're feeling my pain right okay. now. <laughs> it, it, it is hard. I mean, I, I don't have any information either. Um, I started today meeting with members and it's been really helpful for me to learn about the communities that they represent, about the geography. Um, I was telling someone earlier, I was learning about a lake that separates some communities within a district and how that doesn't work well. Um, there is a lot that I can learn from you all because you know your communities like that. Right. Um, so I would encourage you to, to sign up um, and meet with me now so that we can get that information there. And then once we've met the requirements for the numbers and then the requirements for the Voting Rights Act, we can start looking at these these interests with the community and, and overlay that. So, and then I will be available. I have made arrangements with my private practice to, to be available to you all as much as possible, um, you know, before and after. But we are going to be really compressed on time. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I do have to continue to, uh, you know, to work in the private sector too. Right. So I'm all trying right. to schedule it as best I can. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Representative Scott, thank you. Uh, thank you to the chairman's representative, Sandra Scott, District 76. I would like to know, um, can anyone be sponsored by a legislator to work on a redistricting plan with the legislative and congressional reappointment office? as long as they are sponsored? And if not, can plans be submitted by anyone directly to the legislative and congressional reapportionment office with or without sponsorship? And let me, um, I, I believe that, uh, Gina Wright, Ms. Wright, would you, would you be able to answer that? Is that a is that a question appropriate for you? Um, we come up to one of these things. Um, but just just to clarify, anyone can submit anything to us if they have plans that that they think would work and maps that they think would work. By all means, yes, Ooh. submit them to us. It's on. Um, in the past, we have not usually had individuals come in and work with us, especially on the statewide maps. There have been a very rare few times we've had a, sponsor, a legislative sponsorship for someone to work on a local map for their county commission or a county school board. Um, a lot of times that's where the local interest is usually with the citizens. I don't know that we've ever had an individual come in with sponsorship to work on a statewide map. Um, and what was the other, there was another part of your question? Oh, the submission of plans. I think there will be specific requirements for a plan to be submitted in the past. I think that was a part of the guidelines that the committee would eventually vote on um, when the full committees meet. And that would actually spell out how a plan can be submitted to the, to the committee and to, through, our, through our office for review. It would have to be in a certain format and it would have to be a full map and things like that. So um, that would probably be a part of those guidelines. I, I would assume that's what's been done in the past. Okay. Okay. So, um, when would the uh, redistricting committee um, be meeting to adopt the rules? And uh, we know that, in accordance with the Voting Rights Act and other con constitutional requirements regarding such things as one person, one vote, Georgia Code speaks specifically about the redistricting principles of best practices of contiguity. So how can we, how can we uh, be assured that these things uh, will happen? Let me take part of that. At least uh, with regard to the rules, uh, it is uh, Chairman Rich and my intent for us to present and adopt the rules of the committee at the first in-person meeting, which will be our next meeting. Committee, meeting. uh, committee meetings, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the committee today? No one else? Okay. 
All right, and, and I just wanted to, to make the statement for the representatives and the senators. Um, we all receive at our House email address the Senate and House press releases, and um, I share those with my constituents. It, they prompt me to notify them, and I just urge you all to check your House and Senate email addresses and email boxes so that you get those press releases when they go out, and maybe you can send it, Representative Jackson, for example, to um, one of the media outlets. If they got it from you, maybe they would be more apt <laughs> to publish it. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Well, I, I want to make a, just a couple of closing comments. Um, the first is to say thank you to the committee members. Uh, and if we have some members from the House and Senate that are not here, excuse me, if we have some members from the House and Senate that are not on the redistricting committee, uh, and a special thank you to you. I don't know if the folks at home and on Zoom are able to uh, see, but we've got our public servants, our House members and our senators that are here, both Democratic and Republican, that have taken their time from their busy days to come here, and I appreciate that very much. So thank you uh, for your public service. Thank you for your interest in the important work of this committee. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to all of those who participated. Uh, it's encouraging to know that folks are interested in this process and that they want to participate, they want to be heard, and let me assure you on behalf of Chairman Rich, we want you to be heard. That is the purpose of how and why we have structured these meetings for that, for that way. So I would encourage you to uh, share with your friends, those that want to attend the meetings, either the other virtual meeting that we'll have or the in-person meetings that we'll have around the state. Please encourage your friends to do so. And uh, finally, I want to thank the staff that has enabled us to put this together today and this evening and for this to work. Uh, I think as well as it did, we'll continue to try to make improvements along the way. Chairman Rich, any comments you'd like to make before we adjourn? Uh. Okay. Very good. Then seeing no further comments, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.